And um, yes, as Dr. Noel said, I work with him this semester on my thesis for the Honors History Program on Black Thursday. So um, if you all just want to sit back and relax, I'll give a little introduction about our event and what Black Thursday is here at UF. So in 1969, as Black students entered into historically white colleges and universities, they found themselves lost in a sea of white faces, in isolation of any comfort or familiarity. An unnamed student from Lawrence University described this experience as, you're alone, standed, stranded in the middle of white culture. And Stan Herring from Gannon University said it was like being a solitary man, a foreigner in a strange land. Not only did universities in which they pursued their education lack an enrollment that reflected other students who look like them, but they also were void of any courses or social structures that reflected their culture. With the precedents set by the civil rights and black power movements behind them, these anguished students knew what they had to do. In order to get the attention of controlling organizations and state governors who worked to keep their voices silent, they had to find a way to make them listen. They had to speak up and speak out to share their experiences of how institutionalized racism continued even in the ivory tower in short, they had to make a lot of noise. President O'Connell headed UF from 1967 to 1973. His presidency was shadowed by turmoil in the wake of the Vietnam War and civil rights movement. From 1965 to 1972, black and white students on campuses across America protested for greater racial diversity and inclusion at their universities. But President O'Connell had his own plans for his university, first in the South and second to none in the nation. This vision did not include black students who, in his opinion, did not contribute to the quality of the university. Eventually, these differences would cause an eruptive reaction at UF. This was how Black Thursday, the arresting of 66 black students in peaceful protest, came to be. In 1968, after news of yet another student uprising at Columbia University reached him, President Stephen C. O'Connell announced, I wouldn't wait one day to have demonstrators removed from a university building. On April 15th, 1971, he made good on that promise at UF. When members of the Black Student Union, or BSU, went to Tiger Hall that Thursday to demand change, 66 Black students were arrested. In the aftermath, 123 Black students and two Black faculty members left the University of Florida. The event, today known as Black Thursday, has remained as a Black eye for the university even 50 years later. This April 15th marks 50 years since Black Thursday. Though we are only a couple days early, we have gathered some incredible voices from the past, present, and future of the event to help us navigate how UF has changed through the years. I want to say thank you to Carl Simeon for Black Affairs and the Sam Proctor Oral History Program for helping make this event possible. In addition, thank you to our panelists gathered here today who are so willing to share their stories. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Betty Stewart Fullwood, uh, Liddy Washington, and Ms. Geraldine Williams. And so we would like to begin with offering um, the first introduction to Geraldine Williams Esquire. I wonder why. <laughs> because you're awesome. Because I'm the senior person here. <laughs> uh, I am Geraldine Williams. I attended the University of Florida from 1963 to 1967. Graduated Middleton High School in Tampa. And that means that at that time, I was um, from all, all Black schools throughout. For me, the University of Florida was truly a beginning. And, um, but I see myself, I studied journalism and communications. I knew what I was going to study when I, I arrived, and that's what I went through with. But when I arrived, I saw myself then, and I see myself now as part of a relay team. And uh, you young people, everybody is young to me, um, would be also a part of that team. The first uh, runner was uh, Virgil Hawkins, who uh, ran his race. And in 1958, I mean, so unselfishly, he um, entered into an agreement with uh, Florida and, uh, and, and the Supreme Court uh, asking for an order to desegregate University of Florida's graduate and professional schools. And then he would withdraw his application. They did not want him in the law school over there. So he ran the first leg of the race. And then in 1958, that same year, George Stark um, entered, was admitted to College of Law. And uh, he stayed for three semesters, I believe it was. And um, then he felt that he had to leave. 
And then George, Willie George Allen took the baton and he ran and he was there at the College of Law and graduated in 1962. 1962 is important because that's the same year that the University of Florida uh, uh, integrated its undergraduate studies. And our first um, group of seven uh, attended uh, at the uh, Gainesville campus. And then in 1963, my year was the second group. I call it the, the, the uh, first 14 because we together, we integrated the various colleges at the university. Um, I am excited to be a Gator. I saw myself as uh, really being elevated. When I left Tampa, I'm from Ybor City, that's Y-B-O-R City, which is really the uh, Latin quarters. And the section of Ybor City that uh, which I live is called the bottom. And there's a long story about the bottom. We'll talk about that another time. But for me, to leave the bottom and go to the University of Florida was not really going from the bottom. I actually was stepping up to the bottom, meaning that I was reaching for that bottom rung of the white man's ladder to success. And that was education. I am practicing law. I went on to uh, earn an MBA and a law degree. The law degree is from Florida State University and the, the, the Gators have forgiven me for that. But, um, and I am still practicing part-time. Thank you so much for your introduction. Um, we want to um, make sure that another one of our panelists gets introduced. Um, can we ask Ms. Um, Janice Hobdy to introduce herself? Um, I think you're muted. Uh, try and message her while we get her unmuted. Um, Dr. Fullwood, would you mind um, introducing yourself? <laughs> I was trying to help her get on. Okay. Right. Okay. My name is Betty Stewart Fullwood, and I am a native Gainesvillian, and I attended um, all predominantly black, well, all black, Lincoln High School here in uh, Gainesville, and I graduated and went to Bethune Cookman College. I stayed there for a year and a half. With the uh, increase in the cost there, I decided to transfer and come back to the University of Florida. And I started at the University of Florida in the uh, spring of 1970. So it was a year after I came back to the University of Florida that uh, Black Thursday occurred. Um, I'm um, trying to think. So I, with, I withdrew along with other students there. And I came back the next semester to continue my uh, programs at the University of Florida, <clears throat> where I received my uh, bachelor's degree in psychology, my master's degree in social psychology, and a PhD in counselor education and higher personnel. I went on to work at the University of Florida for 35 years. 33 of those, I was the uh, advisor for the Black Student Union. Uh, uh, what else can I say? I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen a lot of things go on there. I've seen a lot of students and I knew it was about time to retire when some of the students that I had in the 70s had were bringing their students there to uh, attend. So I knew then it was uh, about that time. But I always enjoy coming back to university and giving back and just educating folk about the history of the um, African Americans at the University of Florida. In 2002, the December of 2002, um, we, myself, Kevin McCarthy and myself, uh, published the book African Americans at the University of Florida. And this really came about uh, because of a uh, Gator homecoming in 1997. And I think the theme has something to do with uh, looking back at the past or greats. And I did a little brochure that did the first 
of African Americans at the University of Florida. And it pretty much was a list of uh, people that I could find that had, were first in their particular field or area at the university. And I made a mistake of leaving out one person as far as like the, the first uh, black football player, and it was Don Gaffney, who was from Jacksonville. And he made a way to figure out how to call me and, and remind me that he was the first. And so then I started doing more research on trying to find out more about others that I may have missed as well. And then Kevin McCarthy approached me as part of our um, University of Florida sesquicentennial about doing a book about African Americans at the University of Florida. He'd done several books with other uh, co-authors before and decided that would be a good thing to bring out during the sesquicentennial. And so we did that in 2003, and the book was, was published, and um, the rest pretty much is history. Thank you so much, Dr. Fullwood. Um, now, Ms. Janice, would you mind introducing yourself? Someone needs to rename her, because okay. it, it looks like me. I was trying to tell you. My you. name is I'm Betty Stewart's friend. I'm Janice Hobby. Okay, thank you. And um, let's see, I attended Santa Fe Community College and from there, the University of Florida. And I have received from Florida a um, bachelor's in psychology, a master's and specialist in counselor ed. And from there, I worked with um, South Florida Community College as a um, academic counselor for three years. And then I returned home and um, worked for child care resources for 20 years, writing grants, starting the um, child care training and from there, grants for Head Start and several other uh, companies. And um, was very successful as a grant writer and I really enjoyed it. And I did a lot of traveling with that, with Head Start all over the states. And, um, and from there, I... Um, worked with um, Bethune Cookman as the adjunct professor uh, part-time out at Eastside here in Gainesville. And um, I did that for about 19 years. And um, Child Care Resources, I, I was there for about 20 years. I thought that I was gonna retire there, but um, they had other plans. And so um, I worked at um, McClinney as a social worker at Nephis. And from Nephis, I came back home and worked at Taka Charlie for five years until I retired. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you so much for I sharing. Had experiences at Florida, they were all good, most of them. I'm with, okay, thank you. You can continue, I didn't, I didn't, I, I wasn't cutting you off. Okay, well that's okay, that's okay. Um, what Janice isn't telling you is that- I thought we were gonna talk protesters. Uh, for, for Black Thursday, and her son Shelton is the little boy you see holding up the sign on a lot of the oh, old yeah. pictures. I, I have a picture of that. that. I was going to show the picture up. I have it, but you have it also, I think, Alana, don't you? Yeah, I believe. Um, oh, well, Miss Hobdy's holding it up first, but I believe Carl has it too to share his screen. That's her son. Yes. That's my son. He was, uh, I think, three at the time. And um, 
we had the Black Walcott from Florida at the time. And, okay, yes, that's it. And um, I participated, but I decided that I was not going to walk out. I did two of the three steps. And my parents were supportive of my decision to uh, stand for what I believed in. I didn't have a problem there. A friend of mine, mother called me that night and she said, whose purpose is it serving for you to walk out? And that really resonated with me. And I decided that I was not going to walk out because I was not going to defeat my purpose for going there, which was to get an education. And so, um, and I remember my father telling me something. He said, you know, the University of Florida is one of the most renowned colleges there, there is. And, um, it's right in your backyard. So talk, don't talk to me about wanting to go someplace else. And so um, I knew I needed to stay home and, and go there. So I um, pursued my education with Florida through all of the changes and all of the um, difficulties. And I struggled and I stayed there. And um, I'm glad I did. I was able to achieve my mission and accomplish my goals. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I would like um, to let our um, next panelists introduce themselves. Okay, let's. Lydia, would you mind going next? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, good, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Lydia Washington. I use she, her series pronouns. Um, I went to the University of Florida from 2002 to 2006. And I am also originally from Jacksonville, Florida. I also went to all black high school, William M. Reigns, whoop, whoop. Um, and so in my time, which was um, interesting, affirmative action was gone from the state. And so they did a lot of um, recruiting, um, definitely intentional recruiting to um, high schools that were not passing, but had some bright students who deserved an opportunity or a chance. And I was one of them. And so I got fully, um, I, don't, I don't think they have a scholarship anymore, but it's called the Alliance Scholarship. So I had a full ride to go to the University of Florida. Um, I was really excited, just like my colleagues mentioned. Um, I consider it the Harvard of the South. I just knew I needed to go there because I had a sister that also went there and graduated in 2000. And I just knew that if I wanted to elevate it myself, that um, you know, I had to go to Florida. So I was really blessed and excited to get acceptance. Current, currently right now, I am the Director of Student Activities and Involvement at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I went there for to get my master's in higher ed and I'll talk about it a little bit later how um, not only just Black Thursday, but the Black culture and the Black involved, student involvement at UF um, really wanted me to go into higher ed to help out particularly not only just black students, but black women students at PWIs. And so I am now there and it's interesting. I've became that administrator like Dr. Dr. Um, Betty, where people come to me for everything and they, I give them those resources. I never thought I would be that administrator. Um, and however, comma, that's been the passion or the joy of, of what I like to do. And so for me, when it comes to my connection to Black Thursday in 2006, myself and other Black leaders did a um, an event um, outside of, and hopefully I, I say this right, I think it's Tiger Stairs. Yeah, okay, I just wanna make sure, I, I totally forgot. Um, and we basically um, copied, not to the T, but copied and signed a document of acknowledging um, and, and, and giving our thanks to the students who, act, who took, who were very brave to withdraw from the university to make way for all of us. And that was a very emotional moment. We've always heard about the, the stories about Black Thursday and the, and the crisis. And we, and we like knew Dr. 
I always say, Dr. Dell, I got to get it right, Dr. Betty. Um, and we just to actually be there and to meet some of the students, we were like, wow, like if they had not done this, we would not have half the opportunities, whether it be scholarships, the IBC, um, if they didn't get, you know, all the programming and the money, like if those students didn't walk away, we wouldn't be here today. So that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you everyone for sharing um, your introduction and some highlights from your experience. Um, I'm going to pass it to Alana, who's going to explain a little bit of how we're going to open up our um, question and answer portion. Yeah, thank you to all the panelists for sharing your stories. And um, like Carl said in the chat, if you have any questions for them, please feel free to send them in the chat. And then Carl and I will pass off um, asking those questions to our panelists. Um, and then following that will be more of an open discussion based portion where if you'd like to raise your hand and ask a panelist something specifically, you can do that as well. Um, so I do have a few questions that we could start with if no one sends any in the chat yet, but I'll give it another second maybe. People are thinking. Okay, I'll start with the first question, which is why is Black Thursday important to you? So is there someone who wants to go first? Yes. Can I start? Miss Lydia, go ahead. Sure. So why is it important to me? A fun fact, and I was mentioning this to um, Alana, is that the Black administrator, Roy Mitchell, was my principal in high school. And as he was my principal in high school, he never mentioned all of this to me became a mentor for me. So the day I got accepted, that is when I actually heard about Black Thursday. And so why Black Thursday is important to me because he gave me a lot of um, like encouragement, hope and the history of how to hopefully survive and navigate University of Florida. And a lot of people don't know my story. I had some very great days and I had some really bad days at Florida. And without, without Dr. Roy Mitchell, I don't know how I would have been able to you know, make it as in like understanding the big beast of um, navigating being a black student at UF. Um, so that's why Black Thursday is important to me because the administrator that actually left or resigned was my high school principal who helped me out so much during my development as an adolescent. Thank you. Is there another panelist who maybe wants to answer? If not, there's some more questions in the chat. Yes, yeah, I'd like to address it. Go ahead. As the maybe the only one who was pre Black Thursday, it's important to me because the analogy that I gave of our being a part of a relay team means that the young people and I, I was so excited when reading about Black Thursday to see how many blacks were there, uh, and there were only listen to me now there were only fourteen of us. And at that time, there were about 14,000 white undergraduate students and then there were the graduate students. So there was uh, maybe a population on the campus of about 24,000. And let me tell you that you could have survived. We did survive. Now, what I found out later is that uh, many of the 14, took a long time to get through and some didn't survive, some left. I, did, I wasn't aware, I, I was doing my thing. My shero is uh, John Cena Williams McRae. John Cena is um, the first African-American female to graduate undergraduate courses at the University of Florida. She's from Bradenton. And uh, she came over to meet me the sun, uh, summer before I enrolled. And she said, Geraldine, we're gonna put blinders on and we don't care if they don't like us. We, we don't care if they don't speak to us. It doesn't matter. We are here for a purpose. And see, that was our role. Our role was to prove to ourselves first. Remember, we, we were coming from all black education, all black living, period. So we had to prove to ourselves that we could step up to the plate and perform. 
And then we had to prove, prove to the greater world that we could do it. One of the points that um, the Vice President of Student Affairs, and they probably do this every, everywhere uh, at about the same time, uh, said, um, well, after the first, we were in trimester system, and he said, after the end of the first trimester, every other one of you will be gone. And so what I did is I looked to my right and I looked to my left to see who was gonna be gone. Because my mentality was, I'm serious, I have come to stay. Now, we had to uh, be very strong to be here. We had not one, I don't even remember black uh, people cleaning. I, I'm sure they, I, I just don't, I don't remember anybody black on that campus but us. And the campus is 2,000 acres, okay? And I don't think maybe two of the 14 were in the same discipline of study, but primarily I might have seen another black on campus in four years, maybe twice on campus. I mean, because we just didn't even see each other. It was a lonely time for us. Uh, living in the dormitory was challenging, but I found in myself that I am a survivor. And those of us who did finish, like John Cena and some of the others who did finish, we had to build a high sense of self-esteem because we didn't have a single professor, assistant professor, secretary, clerical person. There was nobody there, only the 14 of us. So yes, you could have survived. We approved. I am a living testimony. You could have survived because we did survive, but it wasn't a joy. Um, and like you would have had if perhaps we had gone to Africa uh, or uh, historically black colleges and universities. But what I did is I pushed myself and I'm, I'm religious, I prayed. And I wanted to prove again, not only to myself, I wanted to prove to my parents and my community Everybody there in the bottom was supportive of my parents. We didn't have, this is pre-affirmative action. We didn't have, we didn't have those scholarships related to that. We have any of that. We either could afford, we could afford to come or we couldn't afford to come. That's where we were. So we were pre, we predated everything. All of the advantages, all of the challenges, we, pre, we predated all of that. So we survived. So um, I wanted to prove uh, to my parents that I really, really appreciated. They would come up, drive up from Tampa every other weekend to make sure that everybody knew that they were there to support me. And so they would drive up in their pink Cadillac. Oh, no, we had it ruined, okay? But uh, my father wanted to be sure that I was safe and they wanted to make a statement to everybody around that she has family. And um, I said to the Lord, I, I, I went directly to him. I used to go to my mom, but I went to him and I said, you know, I want to show them that I really, really appreciate all that they have done. That was quite a sacrifice on their part to, to put me through, be there for me and all of that. And, um, and, I, and I was able to come through and win that William Randolph Hearst National Writing Award. And that's a huge deal. Uh, you know, I, 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 I didn't get any encouragement from the College of Journalism uh, to enter, but I did. But to have won that, and at the end of my four years, I told you now, I don't know who was on my right and I don't know who was on my left. I guess they were gone. I don't know. But I finished. And at the end of my four years, I was headed to the U.S. Senate to be honored there. Now, that's how I, I did it. I mean, I'm like, no, I'm not a victim. I won't be, I'm victorious. And that's that's how we have survived. We had to have a sense of high self-esteem. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us, Ms. Geraldine. That was beautiful. Um, there, are, there are some more questions, so I'll ask um, another one in the chat. Um, Lynn is asking, what can UF do to ensure a safer and more fulfilling experience for Black students? I didn't hear the question. Yeah, I'm sorry. What was it? The question was, what can UF do to ensure a safer and more fulfilling experience for Black students? Well, 
Well, I think the um, challenge is with inclusivity that um, Black students have to uh, feel that they are included, that they are a part of the university and not just uh, tangential. Um, I know when I was on campus and well, as a student, I'll go back even as a student, there were a lot of different activities going on that Black students were not involved in, not that they were excluded from them, but they were not included in them. And things went on without their being involved in it. And it, a lot of it was a matter of choice uh, because it was a new environment. And even though there had been students who had graduated you know, prior to me being there, there was still the kind of cliquish uh, coalitions that were there among white students that did not involve uh, black students. Um, so I think in inclusivity is, is a part of it. And then I think the you know, university ha um, has done a lot in the, in the last few years as far as with uh, the Institute of Black Culture and the different uh, multicultural affairs department. And, and so I think they're, they're getting that way. Uh, and I think they just have to keep moving. You can't be stagnant. You can't assume that you've achieved. You can't assume that Black students know that you are there for them or that you are uh, willing to assist them. I think you have to change each and every year, each and every month maybe even, to make sure that Black students are aware that the university wants them there. A lot of the the um, talk back in 70, <clears throat> 71 was that the university only had black students there because they could get federal grants and federal monies. And so that, that was why they were really wanting students, black students to be there. Uh, so it has to be more than a money thing. It has to be a, a, a desire to improve uh, the relationships. Thank you. Okay. Um, go ahead, Ms. Abdi. I, I'd just like to share that what helped me during that time, 69, 70, 71, 72, I was there um, until 75. So um, the Black Student Union, um, the Black Student Institute was available. And I always felt welcome when I went there. It was a comfortable setting. It was across from campus and it was easy access. All of the parking was very bad, but um, they had a little parking lot in the back of it. And um, it, was not, it was not a lot of recruitment to participate in a lot of activities, but a lot of activities were held. And if you hung around there, you know, you were aware of them and you felt welcome and a part of it. And that was a location that I felt comfortable going to and um, reconnecting and feeling my self-worth in that facility. And um, so that helped a lot. On campus itself, there was one counselor that helped me a lot. And um, I did go to her a couple of times and um, she was black and I felt comfortable going to her. So that made a difference in my perspective and um, my planning for longevity because she is the reason that I went to graduate school. And um, she suggested that I go to graduate school even though I was finishing up my undergraduate and uh, I thought, that might have been good enough, but she said, no, that's not good enough. You need to go on and further your education. So I did. And so it made a difference in my life. And um, 
I'm glad I did. And, um, but outside of those two entities, I, um, I just wasn't connected to people that attended a lot of cultural things on campus because it just didn't happen. Thank you. Thank you for so that was that was what I'd like to share to upcoming students that um, be a part of where you think you can you can thrive and belong and um, be active in it, making a difference in your life. I think too that uh, from a perspective of uh, not being there when uh, Geraldine was there, but coming slightly after that uh, and coming from a historically black institution, Bethune Clipman College, well, now a university, there was a big difference. Uh, Janice yeah. and I both had attended uh, Lincoln High School, <clears throat> black, black uh, high school, and uh, went to a black. A historically black institution and coming here um coming back on campus because i worked on campus during the summer before because of a program mm -hmm. that was a part of a grant and so i was familiar with the campus that wasn't a problem i was familiar with gainesville i'm a native gainesvillian but uh walking through campus just the idea that when you would see a black another black student approaching you and you you know you, you try to get yourself together figure what you're going to say hi hello what's up how are you, wave, smile, whatever, and to have them to look away as they pass by you. That was the, the thing that got me when I got back here. But because, like I said, I was from Gainesville and familiar with the campus, that didn't bother me as much as it would have probably bothered someone who was just new to the campus, didn't have any family, friends, or know anything about Gainesville. But I would I would almost want to snatch him and ask him, you know, you know, do you see me? You know, why did you just pass by me and ignore me? Because that wouldn't have happened on a black campus, on Bethune Cookman's yeah. campus. You, you know, you pass by people and you talk. Uh, Kappas, Omegas, uh, Deltas, uh, any of them, you know, you, you, you carried on. And, and I was used to black students working together because you would have um, maybe a, a Kappa that was president of student government. There may have been a Q that was the treasurer. There may have been a, a, a Zeta that was a secretary. There may have been someone in public affairs that may have been another. So even though there were quote unquote divisions based on sororities, fraternities, we all worked together for the good of the students. And I couldn't understand the students that thought that they had arrived and maybe they were just scared to speak. I don't know. But when I would pass someone and they would sort of pretty much ignore me and I would just shake my head because that was not something that we did on the Bethune-Cookman College campus. And so when I became a, a, an administrator or a faculty or staff there, that was one of the things that I'd always talk to students about, the fact that, <clears throat> you know, you have just not arrived for yourself. And I remember doing an analogy that folk thought was probably pretty crazy, but that, you know, if you walked through the campus and you saw somebody hanging from a tree, would you really look on their arm to see if they had an omega engraved in it or a kappa engraved in it, or whether they had the signs for uh, alpha on them? I said, no, you know, that's a black person. So you would that wouldn't matter. And so it doesn't really matter to anyone else, what, you know, um, whether you're that or not, you're black first. Yeah. I, I wanted to add, as I was one of um, Dr. Betty's students, I think for me, my integration, I went to all black high school. So for me, I like under that, that whole, like always speaking and sticking together was really huge. And I will commend her and the Mike Powell's and Dacia's and Walter, rest in peace, Walter Robinson's and who actually had these really great programs where I didn't even 
like as much as it was a white school, a PWI, I didn't feel that way because they brought us in in the summer. Um, we were all we all stayed with each other. We stayed with our friends. Our previews were like it, we, you could tell they put our previews with majority of black students. I mean, there's there were some white students, but we seen each other so much. And so we were onboarded in a way that when we had our first day of school as a freshman, it didn't feel as white, if that makes sense. It wasn't until I got involved with white organizations is when I felt um, the whiteness of the University of Florida. Um, just like our colleague, I think Ms. Janice mentioned, I you know, thrived in BSU, I thrived in Visa, I thrived in students taking action against racism. I don't know if they're still there. Um, there was a lot of black um, organizations that I was a part of. It wasn't until I was like, you know what, let me go step into student government. I really felt the heat <laughs> um, at the University of Florida. One thing that we did as graduate black students, um, we would host, bring a freshman to dinner, uh, invite a freshman to dinner, black freshman, and um, to in indoctrinate them to the um, the whole process. And we share our stories like we're doing now with them so that if if there were some hurdles that they could omit we sh we tried to share that and we did do a couple of dinners with them and then it phased out and we didn't do it anymore but um that was very helpful to um to host a, a freshman for dinner and um invite them to come and they came and um, we had dinner and we had discussion and that was very helpful. It helped me be a part of that and um, I'm sure it helped them. They said it did anyway. Thank you for sharing. Thank you all for sharing. Um, another question that came up in the chat. Oh, Ms. Geraldine? I had to unmute. Okay. I just, uh, following uh, Janice, I wanted to say that when we were there, we didn't have the, 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 the uh, support systems on campus, but the Black community, the people in the Black community supported us. They would come mm -hmm. like, listen, I'm not shy. Yes, you can tell. They, you know, I call them and they'd come pick me up and take me to their houses. And we, we would eat, we would talk. And professionals in Tampa introduced me to professionals in Gainesville and, and my parents to them so that I would have a nexus. I would have a sense of belonging somewhere because uh, we primarily stayed on campus because it was safe for us on campus. Yeah. If you stepped off campus, you're in, you could get into some trouble. But the, I wanted to be sure to say that the black uh, principal at the high school the black doctor, the black dentist, uh, Judge Mickles, our parents were like my parents. They, I mean, I was always there they, and, and, and they still, well, she does, he's now deceased, uh, but his mother still supports me. Whenever I'm honored at the university, she is there. Whenever I'm speaking at the university, she is there. So that was that sense of belonging and we needed that because we had nothing, we had nobody. And except now, on Fifth Avenue was the colored section of town. You could go there on Friday nights and Saturday nights, and I love to dance. Okay, so I could dance, and I and um and and I didn't drink uh, alcohol, but I could have my cokes and stuff, whatever they had, and eat the chicken and the fish. And community, I did get a chance to see the black students. Some of the black students then, not not everybody went, but it was either Sarah's on Fifth Avenue or we were at I. I made sure I went to those people because I needed to have that sense of belonging. And I I turned around and so now wherever I am housed, if some young people need my attention, I give it to them because those people were really good to me. And I appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that. That that that's that's very powerful. Um one of the questions that came up in the chat, um, and I um 
I'm going to try to paraphrase it, and if I get it wrong, uh, Adolfo, you can correct me. Um, was there backlash for those students who did not participate um, from the peers in Black Thursday? I would say no, because uh, just, just like Janice said, um, our parents pretty much supported us. And, I, and, I, and someone asked me in a conversation before, what did my parents think about it? I can't remember a conversation, Janice can remember, but I can't remember a conversation of my mother or my father saying, you know, don't do it or do it, or I don't, you know, or, you know, make the right decision. I don't remember having a conversation. And I'm thinking if I would have had a conversation and they would have been against it, I probably would have followed their wishes, but I don't remember having a conversation uh, for them telling me not to. Uh, the city, the city of Gainesville, the state of Florida, the nation was pretty much right for something like that to happen because of what was going on throughout the world. And I think that uh, with the integration and closing of the black schools, you know, Janice and I got out just in time in '68 when we graduated from Lincoln. The next year, yeah. students that came in '69 that would have been seniors for '69. They closed the uh, Lincoln High School down during their uh, winter break. So they went out in December. And when they came back in January, they closed the school down and bust them all to Lincoln, to um, Gainesville High School and other schools that are around. And then that, that had a, a lot of uh, marching. I wasn't here because I was at Bethune-Cookman, but I know that they were, they were they protested and they marched and they marched and they marched. And I think they did allow them to get certificates uh, of graduation diplomas from uh, Lincoln High School, even though they finished up at Gainesville. Mm -hmm. so there was a lot of protesting going on within the, you know, the city, you know, just yeah. based on the fact that they had closed that Lincoln. And I mean, we, and, you know, Lincoln was the center point uh, of a uh, black community. I mean, that was, you know, the school yeah. churches and Lincoln, especially, I mean, Lincoln high school's band was competitive anywhere you wanted to go, which we were both a part of, uh, you had the choir, you had the, I mean, the chorus, you had the football team, the fighting terriers, you had everything evolved around the schools. And that was pretty much the thing for all black schools within the state of Florida, St. Petersburg, you had Gibbs Academy and Daytona, you had, I forgot now the name there, and Palatka, you had, you know, school, all the schools revolved around there, all of the communities revolved around the black schools. And they took that away. So there was, I'm sure, a lot of protest in the minds of Black parents because they had yeah. seen this coming and going throughout the couple of years. So no, there was no backlash as far as you know my family was concerned or to for the students who decided not to walk out. I mean, I walked out, but I came back. I had to do it. The movie says, you know, it was the principle that no matter. <laughs> You know, I needed to, to walk out, even though I came back. It was a principle of the matter to, you know, to go out and come. Yeah. Thank you. Did anyone else want to share um, to that to that question? Okay, well, we have another question from Dr. Noll. He says, Black Thursday seemed to be an extraordinarily traumatic event, but yet all folks seem to have a deep and abiding love for UF. Why is that? I don't know if that love is deep and abiding for everybody. <laughs> uh, but hey, you know, I, I have three degrees from UF. Uh, I retire from UF. I, 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 get, I get a check from UF every month. Uh, you know how could you how could you hate it um, if i had hated it or thought ill about it then i wouldn't have number one gotten other degrees from there and i wouldn't have worked there so uh, uf has been uh, good to me i can add to i know i put a little joke in there and i said it to colt but um i think for me um my love hate relationship i want to say hate but like the moments where i had um, some deep, you know, not like or issues with UF 
it, it has been more so the institutional systems that, that happen at that university and how, um, you know, if you don't know someone, it, it may not be as a good experience. I'm only speaking from my experience from 2002 and 2006. You know, if it wasn't for my colleagues paving the way to have these resources, these buildings and these programs, I wouldn't be able to, able to um, you know, receive those. But it also still was really hard during 2006 and to, during 2002, 2006. I remember in 2005, we just had the alligator print out the N word and that was horrible. Um, I remember we had to work with black faculty members to work to learn how to do advocacy work to get them to at least apologize because they wouldn't. And so for me, um, the moments that have been really helpful has been like when I have stepped outside of UF. Um, and it's not about a self validation, but when people know that I've graduated and went to school to the University of Florida, it happened. I don't care how old I get. It happens every time. They're like, oh. So you're smart or, oh, like you actually, you you went to the big boy school and I'm like, yeah, I'm that person. So I, I, I try to get my ego to come back down. And so for me, for me, it helps me um, really help them understand that I, not only do I have the experience and I paid for it and I excel very well, but um, you're not going to be able to talk to me or treat me in the ways that you thought you were going to, going to as we were talking. So for me, UF has been much more beneficial graduating from that institution. Um, they talk about, like, you know, with the rankings, as much as they're going up, like, you don't understand the degree value is getting even better for, for me. Um, maybe the students at the moment, they're not, they're like, yo, UF is not where it needs to be at. But when you graduate and you're doing those type of connections and those networks because of racism and institutionalized, how it's institutionalized, um, it, it, it does help you. I've gotten out of parking tickets or tickets in Florida from graduating from UF. Um, I also was a former, um, not former, I guess I'm still in it, a Blue Key member. I've connected and been able to get like a lot of um, job opportunities. Granted, I love Massachusetts, but it has really benefited me a lot. And so when going back to what you mentioned, um, you know, the, the love hate type of relationship um, from a black student during the 2002, 2006, a lot of us um, that I'm still connected to can tell you that we definitely didn't really like, you know, the whiteness at UF, but our black experience was amazing. Um, the championships they won during that time, like, I'll never forget that. Like, that was the first time white students actually acknowledged us in the streets of University Ave, giving us high fives after we won um, our black athletes, right? Um, got us to the got us to those championships, and so for me, um, it was it. I I went to UF at a really um, different moment. Whereas you know you're talking about athletics was excelling. Um, our resources for Black students were very intentional, not just for the first year, but throughout the whole four years. Because my scholarship also paid for me to go study abroad. I don't know a lot of institutions that have scholarships that help you all four years in your books and housing, along with studying abroad, it was an amazing time for me. I'm not saying that's where it's at today, but like I was really blessed that I had the opportunity. And because of that, that's where I'm at today. Thank you. Did anyone else want to speak to that, um, that particular question? The deep and abiding love for UF? Yeah. Ours would be different from everybody else's. And I have been working with the university and trying to reach the alumni of the back of the decade of the 60s. And I, I, you know, I have all of these reasons. I've been told all these reasons and I don't even want to hear them. I mean, I really don't. Um, about, I just hate the University of Florida and I, and I, I don't want to do anything, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, yo, all right, let's move on to the next, next issue because I mean, we're talking, what, 60 years ago? <laughs> uh, but now let me tell you what I did. When I was there, when I needed help, I went to my professors. I, I was about to fail. Um, um, come up, uh, it was a science um, a class, physical science. I didn't, know what, I didn't know what they were talking about. And uh, I said, nope, can't do that. So I went to him and I said, I need help. And I'm figuring... You've been paid to help me, so I'm coming in. Now, there are some students who said, no, the professors didn't like us, and no, I didn't ask that man if he liked black people. I didn't ask him if he liked me. There was no love-hate relationship for me. I needed help, 
He was being paid to be my professor. I mean, so you know what it is? And this, this has helped me in life. I go to people who got the resources. He said, I will meet you here in this classroom um, on Saturdays at 10 a.m. And we will go over the the uh, the work that you, you know, did. because I study. I just didn't, all everything going around and I didn't know which way it was going in and all that kind of stuff. Okay, okay, I tell you what, I got out of it. And that's what I needed to do. And I learned in life. Um, when I need help, just go to the people with me. Did this. Most of them just happen to be white men. And for instance, when I was living in South Africa, um, I didn't have a job. I wasn't on, I wasn't assigned. I just went to help. I mean, I don't know what made me think I could go, but I did. And so I wanted to buy a residence. So now I put my little stuff together now, okay? I'm not, I'm not. I'm not the dullest person in the box, but I had my stuff together and I went into the bank and I asked for a hundred percent loan, mortgage loan. I got it. I guess they thought I was crazy to come and ask for it. It didn't matter to me. They had the resources I needed and they said yes. Okay. I went into Sorito and I'm helping some, some, I said, I went to the people who had the, the Africanos who took, had taken all of the land all of the diamonds, all of the um, all of the the, the, the natural uh, um, resources that were there, and I told them that they had done it and that I needed them to to fund what I was going to do to help some kids over there. And I come back from my experience at the University of Florida. Those were the people who had the resources. They knew they had the money. They 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 knew what I needed to know. So I went to them. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, so I'm not saying I hate the University of Florida. Oh, I'm not. No, I mean, but it's a whole bunch of folks from the 60s who were in that category. Interesting observation. Not one of us of the first 14, not one, sent a child back to study at the University of Florida. Now, it was rough. Emotionally, it was draining. It was tiring. And I called him my major professor from the university, from uh, journalism, came to my residence in Tallahassee uh, and asked me to send my daughter to study there. And um, I thanked him for his visit and I enjoyed having him. He was my favorite person over there in journalism. But her father was president at Florida and University. She was studying pharmacy. And I said, she, she has an option, and that option is to study pharmacy right here where her father is president. I could not see her leaving Tallahassee and going over to Gainesville, the University of Florida, for what? I mean, you know, but it wasn't because I didn't like the university that she didn't come, but not one. We, we were communicating among ourselves, not one. Since, and I know that there are others who have followed and have done that. I think it's beautiful. I think it's wonderful. It's a wonderful network nationally and internationally. I was going to Morocco and I was uh, walking through um, the airport in Paris. Guess what I see? A, a Florida Gator shirt. So I did the shop and you know, hey. Um, so it, it, it just works um, uh, different kinds of ways with different kinds of people for different reasons. I always try to stay on the positive because the negative wears me out. It, it pushes me down and I'm looking for a way to survive. If I'm going to jump down, I'm going to land on my feet, standing straight up and being negative. It doesn't work for me. It, 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 and I'm not too sure it works for those who are, you know, in, in that hate relationship with the university because it doesn't help. Thank you for that. Then Amani, did you want to take the next question? Yes, and so Dr. Noel had a follow-up question. Should the name of the O'Connell Center be changed? You know, we went through that uh, when they were naming the O'Connell Center. We went back and forth on that. Uh, and I, I know I was the uh, chattiest uh, Bullard. Uh, was a student governmental vice president at the time. I can't remember was he, Lydia. And he was on the committee with me that we were discussing. And so he and I were talking uh, 
amongst ourselves and pretty much said, you know, you know, that was just the way of the South back then. That was, he was only doing what others were doing in the South. Uh, and, you know, to keep protesting the naming of his, the building of the O'Connell Center uh, was just that allowing us to hold on to a lot of hate. And in order to go forward, we just need to let go of the hate. So uh, was I, you know, enthusiastic about them naming the O'Connell Center, you know, the O'Connell Center? No, but that was, you know, he was doing only what was being done. I know a lot of um, things are going on now with, you know, Confederate uh, statues being taken down and buildings and schools being renamed and all of that uh, as well. But I don't really see a purpose. I mean, he's dead and gone. Uh, everyone knows what he did, what he didn't do. Uh, and so you'd probably pretty much have to rename everything in, in, in the, the state of Florida. And I know they're doing it in Jacksonville. They're talking about naming, renaming schools. We, we had a renaming of a school here in, uh, in Gainesville. And uh, I'm sure there will be talk, you know, for years to come, but to me, that's not a, a major um, major activity. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Forward. Did anyone else want to comment on that question? Okay. And so moving on to the next question, um, in what ways, if any, can you identify similarities between the events of Black Thursday and that of the current social political climate. Well, I'll talk. <laughs> no one else is talking. I've had the experience. Oh, okay. Um, of Black Thursday. offers a sensitivity that we can take from that and use it today. It will be relevant today as far as um, creating that culture of sensitivity that was pretty much lacking during my tenure at Florida. But um, today, the acceptance is better between new races. And we can build on that more readily today than then. So We've sensitized the ethnicities to the point that um, we can have conversations that are pertinent and relevant and meaningful between the different ethnicities. That's my takeaway from it. Thank you for sharing that. Did anyone else want to speak to that? I think that, you know, Black Thursday was uh, an event that uh, came about because of a lot of different things that were going on on campus. And there were pinpointed uh, points that the Black students were looking for. And I think the same thing is going on with uh, Black Lives Matter. I'm not sure if that's what they were talking about, the person that asked the question. But uh, with Black Lives Matter and with all of the uh, racial unrest here, uh, especially during the last uh, four years. Um, and I think that there are uh, some serious points. And I think that the students are stepping up to the plate uh, throughout uh, the United States. 
and they're realizing that you know they have to protest they have to make their voices heard they can do it uh, by voting and they can also do it by protesting so i think that uh, this is what is going on and i think that it's good i i wanted to add it from a higher ed perspective um i wasn't at as you all know i wasn't at black thursday but from as an administrator currently right now on college and i'm pretty sure there are some black administrators on this call I definitely think um, there are some similarities as in black students not feeling fulfilled or not having the resources or not feeling connected at PWIs. Black students are still um, submitting demands and asking for the same, like if you look at the demands that was submitted um, with Black Thursday, some of the things that they are talking about is more administrators, more spaces, more money, more resources. So some of the similarities um, you know, not just, I don't know UF's business because I don't work there, but like at U, UMass, that is the same thing that my students are asking and demanding. They want, they, I tell them about the IBC and they're like, oh my gosh, you have a whole center dedicated to black students where they just have a very two, a two it's like two rooms that's connected to a dining hall. And they, and they're like, we're, they're fighting for that versus an actual building, right? And so our students are also fighting for more Faculty of color, we live in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, if you are, if you identify as black and you come up here, you better have a family because if you're single, like it's just not gonna work out. And so like, you know, our students, you know, I, I always talk to them about Black Thursday and I always talk to them about University of Florida and what you all are doing. And I'm not saying I compare to com contrast, but they are also saying the same thing that a lot of students have, have asked over the years is just to be heard, to be seen so that their college experience could be something um, as they pay for it, right? That could be something that is worthwhile for their, for their liking, if that makes sense. And I definitely know there's different generations and different asks, but I think the similarities is that black students are still requesting more resources or some type of acknowledge that they're here at, at these white institutions. Yeah. yeah, thank you for all those answers. Um, we have another question in the chat from Angel. So they give some background. My previous institution, the University of Richmond is undergoing a huge black student coalition led movement to rename the buildings of white slave holders. They began a process of disaffiliation but the board of trustees is not budging. What recommendations would you suggest? So how do you get administration to listen to you? I think pretty much with, with the uh, administration, you really have to uh, attack the stakeholders, those who support the school, uh, those who are involved in uh, alumni affairs, I think that's where it has to come from. Uh, I know with uh, O'Connell back in the day, there were a lot of people that were trying to get him to do the right thing and not to do the wrong thing, pretty much. And he refused to listen to them because he felt that, you know, he was the uh, uh, overseer of that plantation <laughs> and that you were going to do what you know he said do because he was the overseer not because it was right or wrong and so i think they probably have to start you know looking at those who uh, fund the university and even alumni who support the university yeah i was going to say the same thing as the admin my my institution's a little different it, they are we are really huge on um community advocacy and so for our students what we probably would have done um they would have like like dr betty mentioned um connected with alumni connected with all stakeholders they would have done a, a letter and media campaign um they would have gotten all types of media our students do it all the time they bring in the boston globe and that's when everybody starts listening and so um they did a lot of different tactics but it depends on like um, the making of the board of trustees, who's on there, who they're connected to, and who kind of, and I hate to say this, has the power to make those decisions. Um, and how do you create those collaborative conversations, not adversarial conversations, so that you, you could, so they can hear or listen to how this has impact would be my answer. Thank you all for sharing. Um, we have a question. Um, we were able to survey some students prior 
um, to the panel. And one of the questions um, that I'd like to pose to you from um, the student um, uh, poll is, how do you think student life would have changed if Black Thursday never occurred? Well, well, the usual for blacks would have changed for blacks. Blacks are so creative; they would have come up with a way to um, experience their life if Black Thursday had never happened. And so, um, Yeah, I think that eventually with everything that was going on throughout the nation, uh, with Kent State, I mean, there was just protests going on everywhere with the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, apartheid in South Africa. There was a whole lot going on. And so I think that change was going to come, as the song says, eventually. Uh, so if it was not Black Thursday, there would have been some other event that would have uh, ticked it off. Thank you all. Yeah. Um, did anybody else want to respond to that before we move to another question? Well, sticking on the topic of Black Thursday, we did have a question in the chat if any Black faculty on campus at the time were involved with Black Thursday activities. Yes, there were numerous. Uh, the ones that were here, there weren't that many here, but uh, the, and I, and I have this. PowerPoint presentation in the background because I was doing it for another presentation, but I, I have it just to look at. Uh, Mr. Roy Mitchell, he was uh, the black administrator that was here, as Lydia talked about. Uh, Mr. Neil Butler, Neil, Mr. Neil Butler was the uh, mayor at the time, but he was mm -hmm. also a graduate school uh, student in nursing, working on his master's uh, in nursing. Um, we also had, uh, let me get my thing up behind here so I can not leave out. Cause I started, actually I started a list, I started a list of, uh, I call it African-Americans at the University of Florida honor roll. And I started mm -hmm. putting down names because I was going through my, uh, my book. I think at the time, uh, David Horn, uh, Janice, wasn't he a professor at uh, Santa Fe? Yes, David Horn. Uh, was one of them as well. Um, also, Father Michael Gannon, he was a, a white, um, I don't know if it's Catholic, but he, he was a priest, I think, here. He was very active and had, had O'Connell's ear trying to help him to make right decisions. He was very active uh, with what was going on on campus uh, as well. The majority of the folk who um, were here, the, the, the majority of the African-Americans instructors that were here came after uh, Black Thursday, but the ones that first ones that came after Black Thursday um, were, um, oh boy, thanks. Clicking on the wrong one, can't find it, were uh, Dr. Uh, well, Thomas A. Wright, he was teaching some courses on campus. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ronald Foreman, Dr. Elroy Chow, uh, Professor Betty Green Ingram, Carlton Davis, Elwin Adams, Billy Avery. Uh, those were people that were here on campus at the time. And I know that there were at least five of them who were, um, turning their resignation along with Roy Mitchell. That's really great to know, Dr. Forward. Definitely, definitely, thank you for sharing that. So, we were, are we, uh, is that a sneak peek for uh, volume two of African Americans at the University of Florida? <laughs> All right. So, another question um, um, if anyone else um, uh, wanted to respond. Another question is, how would you all um, 
explain the importance of Black Thursday to new first year students. I think the importance of Black Thursday is pretty much like uh, persons explain the 34th Street wall and that block of wall that's carved out from 1990 for the student murders that you know that particular block is sacred because those five students that died and there you know you you don't want to forget and it's pretty much like uh the Jewish nation remembers the holocaust uh, black thursday is something that's you know it's not as traumatic but it may have been traumatic for certain students those who decided to withdraw and not come back or those who uh May may have uh, withdrawn and and decided to come back, but I think it was a decision, you know, that everyone had to make for themselves. But I think it's a pivotal point in the black um, student involvement here on campus, and I think that they should. Uh, that's a turning point, because before we were just trying to get in. You know, we wanted to be a part. We wanted to be, you know, see what this university was all about. And uh, once we got here, it was like, okay, well, we see what it is, but it's not what we want it to be, so we need to change it. And I think that's what Black Thursday was a pivotal point in the African Americans at the university. Thank you, Dr. Fuller. Um, I also think it's important, what I would tell a first year student um, is that um, I believe Ms. Jardine mentioned this, it's a, it's a great, live example about understanding about survival at University of Florida. And I'm glad she brought that up because I think what, what Dr. Betty mentioned is that, yes, you, you fight so hard to get in UF, but how do you stay there? <laughs> and how do you make sure that um, you graduate? And it's beyond like making your parents proud. It's about these students of Black Thursday who you know, the ones that did walk away, the ones that walked away and came back and actually pushed through and did not care what anyone said um, at that university. And so to hear and to know that um, our, 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 um, our fellow former students did this is important to know when you come into UF because you will have a moment where you're like, Do I, can I really push through? Or am I gonna be able to make it? And so to think that the students um, who did this were able to do this without any resources, right? Not that many administrators, not an IBC building, not um, Black homecoming and no fraternity sorority life, none of that. They, 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 did, they did it. And so to know that they did it to me, um, I know when I was an incoming student and I heard about it, just pushed me through. And so I think it should be a part of the Black cultural history to connect first year students to understand the importance of it, it, it's not it's not a conversation about like oh we don't want to deal with white people it's about this is what happened and this is how they set the example and the expectations and as you become this first year black student at this university that knowing this history and knowing the benefits that happened from this from this time to now that you can also to do do this and make it too so I think it's very important for them to know it because what ends up happening sometimes when you're a young student and that's my work email so i apologize oh gosh um what happens sometimes as a black student like you hear about and i'm not even trying to be funny like my students say this all the time i never got a chance to meet my Luther king i heard about him right or i never got a chance to see malcolm x you our current black students actually get to meet these wonderful pioneers that open up the doors for us and so as they are here creating books um, making different aspects of, you know, supporting the state of Florida or wherever our colleagues are at, it's important for our first year students to get to co get connected. Like this program that you are doing is amazing because as a higher ed, higher ed education, students need to hear this. And it's not, and we're not even coming from a place like back in the day, this is how we did it. It's more so here's the history. This is how we made it. And we're here to support you. And I think that is the part for black students today is they're, they're not connected to the history and the real live like heroes that are here today. And so that's why for me, it would be important for first year students to know 
all of us um, that either, you know, went through it, supported or remembered it in whatever way when we were student leaders. So that way they can continue on the history um, when we have more black students to come. So that's what I would tell a first year black student, because we all know this. Um, when you join UF, it's, I always say this. Um, People are like, you know, you can see a UF thing, go Gators. And I remember it changed to Gator Nation when I was in school. And so people connect to that. And so imagine if, you know, there was, if we start the culture for black students, like when we're connect, when we're, when we're connecting, that we connect it to something um, that is ours, right? Um, now, now, I'm not saying Gator Nation is not ours, but I'm just getting to a point where it is important to um, establish and maintain our history and our connections for generations to come. Because that, if you look in the history, especially for particular African-American people, like our, some of our history was stripped. We don't know where we came from. So when I think about UF, I'm so blessed that I use Dr. Dowdell. Like, it's funny because Dr. Dowdell and I, like, are, you know, we grew up in the same um, religion. Um, and now I'm in her sorority. And she also was a mentor for me. And I will always have that connection. Um, but the biggest connection in the first connection was University of Florida. And so I am blessed to still connect with her. I'm still blessed. I can see what's going on in her wonderful life versus mine. And that's where we have to do or, or open up those platforms for first year students so that they can still feel connected at UF. Because around that sophomore, junior year, I mean, I don't know if things have changed, but it gets hard. It gets really hard. You know, you finish your major coursework, you're going into your your major and you're trying to figure out what are the two next steps. So having that support is important. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Carl, let me offer. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, jo Geraldine. It was a saying that I, I used to tell students uh, that University of Florida was like New York. They said, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. So that if you can make it at UF, you can make it anywhere. And I know that, you know, in, in the seventies, when I was an undergrad, the, the, the quote unquote weed out course there was uh, introduction to psychology. Everybody had to take introduction to psychology to go into your upper whatever. And that was it. And I know in the nineties, it was differential equations. I have no idea what differential equations was, but I know that there, I had a plenty of students coming to my uh, office crying about uh, not doing well on a differential equation. I could not help them. <laughs> I could not help them at all. <laughs> but uh, they are, they are, there's, there are certain uh, things that we have to get over. And I think that University of Florida is the best teaching uh, institution that can teach you how, because it's all about teaching you how to learn. You, you learn how to learn because you learn how different instructors uh, uh, approach different topics. And so you learn for that class and then you know for the next semester you may have to learn a different way for another person. So you are constantly changing and learning how to learn because when you have to regurgitate what they have given you on an exam, you have to know where they're coming from. So it, it's a really good uh, teaching tool. And I think that that's what we should do as far as the uh, history of uh, African Americans at UF. I want to share that um, I think it's important for the uh, young people to know that what happened in uh, 1971 was tame in comparison to what was happening in the 1960s. Uh, when we were integrating the, uh, in the Southeastern universities, uh, two students were killed, I mean, not students, but two people were killed over at the University of Mississippi when uh, Meredith was, was going in to enroll. And then, of course, we had the Alabama governor standing in the doorway uh, blocking the, um, the students who were being escorted by federal marshals uh, and saying never. And then we had Georgia where um, the uh, journalism student had transferred in and she was in the dormitory and uh, the uh, rioters were coming over to take her out. So they had to get her, they had to go in and and uh, and protect her and get her to safety. Um, and come on around to Florida, uh, we had uh, uh, some students who were brought in, some teenagers who were brought in. 
and they were integrating a, uh, an Ian, I -E -N -N, over in uh, St. Augustine. They were integrating the, 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 uh, the swimming pool. And the owner came and poured acid into the swimming pool. Um, and here we were in Gainesville. Um, and, he, and then in 1971, you think that it was it was calamitous. It was it was big. It was huge, and it was. But we take everything in comparison, and so it it was what we needed at that time. Let me say that in the decades of the '60s, we didn't have the numbers. We didn't have uh, the support at all. Okay, but because I was the journalist, and many of you who especially are researchers don't know that I recorded, I actually wrote for the, um, the Gator, that it was, it was the uh, alligator was on campus at that time. And I go back and I read some of the articles. It, it, it really lays out the history of what we were going through. And also uh, as a journalism student and being the only black, uh, I had to go with the white students and Mr. Cunningham over to the Gainesville Sun to, you have to lay out the paper. Okay, so we went over to lay out the paper. And Mr. Cunningham said, this is in 1967. The Civil Rights Act passed in 1964, I believe it was. And so Mr. Cunningham said, Geraldine, we're going down to have lunch, come join us. And I said, uh, okay. So we all walked down and there must have been eight because he would make nine. And then there was a white attorney, a male attorney who, who sat there with us. And this was, in walking distance, is right downtown. And um, the young lady came and she was the waitress and she put a place setting for everyone except me. I was um, a little more than pissed. <laughs> I was very upset. I got up and I left. And uh, Mr. Cunningham told the, the newspaper editor and he sent for me. And he suggested that I, okay, go ahead and, and be angry about what happened. I, I can see that, but what I don't see is letting that be the end all. So what I want you to do, and I did, he said, I want you to write th a three part series and I will publish it in the daily newspaper. And it was uh, on public accommodations because this is what's going on. This is 1967 and I wasn't being served in 1967. And, and the second part was on police community relations. And uh, the other, third part, and they're probably not in the same sequence that I'm giving to you, the town-gown relationship. Now, see, as an African-American student, what I could do on campus and, and how I was treated there was totally different from what it would likely be in the community, except at Fifth, on Fifth Avenue at Sarah's. But I'm saying that what, uh, 1971 is what got the, the uh, media attention, we also had a precursor to that was the kind of stories that I was writing as a student journalist so that we could go back and we could see and we could appreciate at that time, contemporaneously, we could appreciate what was actually happening. So just uh, for a reference, we know that the, the uh, alligator would have some stories and the, the Gainesville Sun would have some stories about what, so that was our, our protest. I mean, we, we were articulating, we were sharing with the community to let everybody know that we too had problems. Thank you all very much. And so I know that we are nearing the close of the program. And so wanted to just open up to our panelists, any closing thoughts, um, from um, you know, what you've shared tonight or just anything that you wanna leave um, the students um, that are on, the faculty and community members that are on um, and future students that may see this one day. Carl, if I can say something, I, I just got a message from um, Angela Linder and I don't know if people know who that is. She's the associate provost and she was on here and she said, I'm grateful to learn from and be inspired by our panelists tonight. I'd love to get your thoughts on how we can find ways to pass on this history to all of our undergraduate students. I have to run, but we'll reach out to you to find some time to chat. So this has made a difference, I think. And I, I wanna thank Alana and I wanna thank all the, the panelists for, for participating in this. Um, it's 
Um, my, I, it's um, extra credit for my students in my Florida history class. I just wish more of them had been here. Um, but this is fabulous. And I really appreciate you taking your time to do this um, really important duty for duty for, for the for the community, not just the black community, for the Florida community, the UF community. And thank you. Yes. Thank you for sharing that in. And, and we will be working with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program and also our Division of Student Affairs uh, Marketing uh, to be able to you know, make sure that this is captured uh, and curated um, um, adequately so that it can be available. Um, and so when we get more details, we have the emails, um, everybody who was able to participate tonight. And so once we have um, the information in terms of how we will be able to uh, make this available, we will definitely share that out um, with the community. Okay. All right. And so, did, um, what, did any of the panelists want to share any final thoughts as we close? I just want to say thank you for the invite to participate in the panel. It it encouraged me. It benefited me, and I'm happy to be a part of it. And in the future, we can continue. It's been a long time since I've been on a panel like this. And um, I think it was very beneficial to be a part of such an historic event. So thanks again for the invite. Yes, and thank you to you, and you've been a delight. All of you have been a, a great delight. I, I can go next. Um, to the students who are here, um, I would say, particularly also the, our, our students of color, our BIPOC students, please don't give up or lose hope. Um, I know there's some really great faculty members, staff members who are on the campus that want to make sure that you succeed and become that wonderful um, Gator alum. And so just when you have a moment, whenever you feel like you you just can't take any more, take an opportunity to breathe and also be thankful for the privilege that you have to be a part of the University of Florida. Um, and I would like to say thank you so much um, to um, Alana and also Dr. Betty for connecting me to this. I have not done anything on this level um, with UF in probably like 15 years. Um, a, a backstory of me, I used to be the university um, UF vice president and I had to resign. It was not a really good experience and I did not appreciate what happened to me, right? However, comma, um, I think UF had a homecoming, the black homecoming and I went and I reconnected. And so it goes back to that love hate relationship where I was like, you know what? I see our black students need our help. I'm a really good resource. How can I get my feet wet? So thank you for giving me an opportunity to come back. I love UF. I, you know, bleed orange and blue because if it wasn't for the University of Florida, I have no idea where I would be at today. Um, coming from the hood um, and, and, you know, they say Jacksonville, but I'm from Duval, right? Um, there's no way I would have not had seen the world or had great mentors like Dr. Betty and Sharon Austin and Dr. Stephanie Evans, who also got, gave me an opportunity to publish in a book. I would have never got these opportunities if I didn't go to the University of Florida. So I am humble, humbly thankful and grateful. And I do pray that the um, University of Florida between student affairs and campus life and the history department that you all do elevate this. And there should be a class about black um, students from UF because Imagine how many, like the history that we now have, it is worth teaching to all the students. And a lot of our black alumni have done such great, not only contributions to the state of Florida, but to the world. Um, and so I think it would be really great to make sure that um, we elevate that story and that people understand that if it had not been for Black Thursday, we would not have these wonderful alums that we have today. So thank you again. And I hope to connect with you all I will put my email in the chat if those who want to connect um, and then hear about, you know, some really cool, crazy stories back in 2002 to 2003. I'll be more than happy to share with them, but not on this recording because I have no idea where it's going. But um, I will put my information out. But thank you again. And to the panelists, 
I've also learned again from you all. You are amazing. And I humbly want to say thank you to Ms. Janice, to Dr. Betty and Ms. Geraldine. Thank you for not giving up and thank you for pushing through because if y'all had not done that, this young little girl, um, which I guess I'm a little older now, would have not been able to have the opportunity. So thank you so much. I am humbly thankful. Thank you folks so much for sharing that. Um, I wanted to pass it on to whoever, whoever uh, is next in sharing. Any final thoughts? I'll share. I want to thank you and the organizers for inviting me to be the face of the decade of the 60s. <laughs> it's okay, that's what it really is. And, um, because we were silent, we had to be cautious, um, but we persevered and, and we, we got through. It's uh, important to let our young people know that we were the bridge builders. They didn't just show up in 1971 and get the media coverage without having some foundation being laid, some building blocks being uh, constructed there. And I just feel great. When I come back to the university, I look around and I look at all of the black and other minority students and I say, these are my grandchildren <laughs> because I had something to do with their opening doors for them. And I mentioned just in, uh, just, just, uh, uh, just offhandedly, about um, affirmative action. But there was a graduate student who came to visit me and um, she, she spent the day with me and she, uh, and, I, and I thought, I mean, I'm really honored. She was from Brazil. She was a grad student from the university. And she was talking with me about how affirmative action helped me. How, explain so that I can put the, make this part of my thesis you know, that, that uh, affirmative action, and it was all about affirmative action. And I looked at her and I said, sugar, I'm so old. <laughs> I was before affirmative action. <laughs> she couldn't believe it. And she was like, whoa. So now I said, that's another, that's another chapter. <laughs> all of us didn't come through, okay? Now I came over to the campus and then before the, the COVID virus, I would, I would come up to, to different meetings and I, I spoke at the, uh, to the journalism um, administrators and faculties and a student came to me, a black female student, and she said, Ms. Geraldine, I need some help. I said, how can I help you? She said, what do I say to them, whoever them is, uh, when they say, you are in my friend's spot? If it weren't for you, my friend would be here. And, and I said, well, listen, honey, what they're trying to do is they're trying to make uh, put you in a defensive position. Now, what I, I want to pass on to the young people, anybody who can hear me, have in your hip pocket a card that you can pull out for whatever situation arises. And I said, now, when they approach you again, you just tell them, tell your friend, thank you. Don't, don't be defensive, don't be apologetic, thank you. Uh, because when I came, the, the students who would talk with us were the Jewish students. And I, and I may have said this in another setting with uh, some uh, University of Florida uh, alumni. And, but one decided that she was going to set herself apart from me. She wasn't just gonna communicate with me, we have a nice conversation. So she says, you know, you're, you're, you're a student too. Yes, I am. And so you're from uh, a secondary, a subculture. I said, I don't know what you mean. Well, um, it, what she, you, you understand where she was coming from. Uh, and you're from the ghetto. I said, uh, okay, now, now you can. She said, yes. I said, let me explain. No, I am not from the ghetto. I had heard ghetto and ghetto when I was in high school. Ghetto, ghetto, ghetto. So I went to the dictionary and I read ghetto. 
everything's ghetto. And it was dealing with black people being being in from the ghetto. But when I did, looked up the definition for ghetto, I was ready. I put that in my hip pocket and I pulled it out on her. I said, no. I was born and raised in Ebor City. That's my D-O-R city, in case you don't know, okay? And um, it is a, a community of different ethnicities. We have the Italians, Sicilians, African-Americans, the Cubans, primarily. That, that's, that's the composition. So because we have a mix of ethnicities, then it is not a homogeneous grouping like you have come from. So you are the one who has, have come from the ghetto, not me. You see what I'm saying? No, I'm not apologizing. I'm not letting you make me feel badly about a doggone thing. And so what was I, 17 years old? I, I, and I, 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 you know, right now, you know, you want me to be black, you want me to be female, you want me to be old, whatever, you know, and they say, oh, no, what other cards you got? I, hey, I got them. But that's what they have to do. They have to be prepared. Don't apologize for a doggone thing. When they try to make, so thank you and me. Thanks. Appreciate that wisdom. Appreciate that wisdom. Dr. Fu, what is it on you? I don't know if I can follow that up. <laughs> but um, um, I guess if I were going to give advice to um, students that are there, it would be to uh, know thyself. That's what uh, I used to tell students all along: is to know thyself, and that's pretty much to know what what your limits are, what your what your qualifications are, and, and to go for it. Um, there's some people who I said would come to campus, and you know you could party all 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 night long and still go to class and make A's on exam. Some people they needed to study all night long just to get a a, a C on an exam. Uh, so, you know, what your neighbor is doing or your roommate is doing may not be what you need to do. And so that, that goes with life as well, that you have to know what your limitations are. And to, like uh, Geraldine said, you know, to not be, to be unapologetic. I love that, that shirt that I have. I got from the IBC that says unapologetically black, uh, and I wear it sometimes and I just watch reactions of people when I wear it because, you know, I, I'm bold, I'm out there, you know, this is where I am, this is who I am. Uh, you can't uh, look around me or, or, or uh, avoid me because I'm, I'm in your face kind of a thing. And I think sometimes you have to be in your face bold. And um, I think that the, anyone who has made it to the University of Florida can make it through the University of Florida. And all you need to do is to uh, find that help, find that home, the IBC, uh, black faculty and staff, and, and non-black uh, faculty and staff as well, because it takes the whole village, not just a, a black community. The black community is pretty much the supplemental part of it, but uh, it needs the whole community um, to make you be successful there. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go into detail about it, but there was a, a an advisor, Dr. Uh, Colonel Colonel Morton Wolfson. He was advisor uh, you know, while I was in undergrad, and he's the one that set up my schedule. And I had to take this, this physical science and biology, physical science and biology every semester. I hated physical science and biology, but those were two weed out courses as well. And so I think the third semester, after I'd gotten D's in them, them both two semesters, he said, okay, let's switch it up. Let's try to do something else. And I took, uh, I think, African-American history, and I took uh, something, some, some sociology course and whatever, and I got and, and some English course, and I got A's and B's. And I said, whoa, I'm not as dumb as I thought I was. Uh, and so, you know, it, it took him to to – show me that you know there was more than one way to get to where you need to go you just needed to be able to realize that you could do it and so i think that realization is what got me through is that you know i was able to do it with a little help from my friends well thank you all so much um uh as as as, as uh, i've heard uh, some of my kinfolk down south say uh, my cup is full um, and I, I feel really enriched from um, the wisdom and the, 
um, insights and just the experiences, the stories, everything that you all have shared. Um, and so I am, I am forever grateful for you all participating. Um, I want to extend a special thank you to uh, our co-sponsors, our um, Samuel Proctor over history program. A special thank you to Alana Gomez, my uh, co-moderator, um, and her work on, on putting together this event, as well as our other coordinators, Adolfo Romero and Deborah Hendricks. Um, this tonight would not have been possible without all of their help um, and our additional co-sponsors, the Black Student Union and the Black Graduate Student Organization. And so um, I want to um, uh, pass it to Alana to have any closing remarks that she would like to share. I thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you, Carl, so much as well and for Black Affairs for helping put this together and dedicating this whole week to Black Thursday and the history of it. Um, so that's amazing. And I just want to say thank you to all the panelists as well. It's been amazing to see my thesis come to life, basically, and to hear those stories and that wisdom told directly to me and being able to educate other people here in the Zoom and being able to share your stories with others um, has been very special to me. So I just want to say thank you again, because this is how it should be. This is what UF should be encouraging. Um, there should be an education on this and everyone should be at this panel right now. Unfortunately, they are not, but thank you to those who came because this was very enlightening and very telling of um, where we are now and where we're hopefully heading. So thank you all. Yes, yes, and I, I put the, the website in the chat. And so um, please visit our website. Uh, there's some other activities happening throughout the week. Um, we'll be doing some media releases of some um, uh, content that we've been able to develop uh, to uh, commemorate the 50th anniversary and honor the legacy of Black Thursday. And so um, it's definitely an important um, effort and initiative um, of uh, Black Affairs and uh, other groups on campus. And so, you know, we, we hope that we are doing um, uh, the legacy um, justice uh, in, in, in what we are able to offer um, to make sure that the story continues to be told and those experience continues to be shared with uh, the future students and the current students and prospective students and um, folks in the in the UF community, and so I I can't I can't express gratitude enough uh, for all of you, and so um, uh, we know we have uh, definitely uh, taken uh, much of you all's time tonight, and so I um, want to definitely um, um, you know be able to close officially close the program um, for you all to be able to move forward with your your evening activities, but so appreciative and definitely looking forward to. Um, staying in touch with everyone and, um, and connecting again soon. And so um, with that being said, we'll say thank you um, and good night. And we hope that you um, join us for some of the other activities during the rest of the week. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.